Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Grace and peace to you on this most holy of days, Easter Sunday. I'm Reverend Cindy Carr, the senior minister of the First Congregational Church of Watertown, United Church of Christ. We are a congregation that welcomes people of diverse backgrounds, orientations, and faith experiences. No matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome with us at First Church. This time for online worship is being brought to you by the deacons of the church as a way to stay connected in faith and to keep our spiritual focus this season. We had originally hoped to be back in the sanctuary by Easter, but we will remain compliant with the governor's stay home, stay, stay safe directive. Although we are physically apart to stay safe, we are connecting. Many in our congregation are tuning in and we're reaching new people each week. We hope this online experience of worship provides you with a message of inspiration and hope for Easter. Today we will bring you a joyful service in which we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You will hear a traditional scripture reading for Easter. Our music director Eric Trudell has prepared wonderful Easter music for us to hear. And I will share with you a perspective for celebrating Easter during this time of pandemic. I have a few announcements for you. We urge you to check your email and our church website for information and announcements. Each week, I am sending out a message from the minister. It will arrive by email or by regular mail for those without email. There are church school activities available for the kids and a weekly devotional for adults. You can call or email the church office if you'd like to receive these. The deacons are making calls and checking in with members and friends who are in need. We've had a great response from people willing to help with things like grocery delivery, sending cards, and so on. We have a wonderful congregation that has not forgotten the importance of outreach right now. And groups like Standing Committee and Deacons have been meeting in virtual spaces like Zoom and WebEx, so we're all in touch and so that our church stays strong. So let us begin our time of worship with these words. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. God is good with steadfast love that endures forever. The Lord is my strength and my might. He has become my salvation. I shall not die, but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Please pray with me. God of the resurrection, we thank you for the new life that you have given Jesus and all who follow him. Through the power of your spirit, inspire us to make a leap of faith into your loving arms. May we believe the words of scripture when they speak of your victory over death. And may we accept the promises you make for the future. We praise you for your love, your joy, and your wonderful living hope. Hope that points us to a future that we cannot see but that we believe you will guide us through. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.
As a congregation, we gather in prayer each week for the needs of the world, for the needs of our community, and for ourselves. So if you would, once again, please join me in prayer. God of love and mercy, as we worship today, keep in our prayers those in our congregation and wider community who are struggling against the coronavirus. We have several who are hospitalized at this time and their family members are self-quarantined. We're praying for fevers to come down, for breathing to be easier, for antibodies to kick in, for resilience and persistence and patience for all who are sick. We pray for family members who can't visit their loved ones and for those who may not survive. We pray for all the nurses and doctors, respiratory therapists, housekeeping staff, administrators, and everyone else who are, keep, are keeping our hospitals running, able to care for so many people. We placed a red heart on the door of Trumbull House in their honor. We pray for teachers and parents who are connecting with kids to keep education from sliding, to provide a new normal, to comfort the youngest among us who are confused or fearful. And we pray for your church, O oh God, that we may provide outreach in a safe way, letting all who are scattered in these days feel the love and care of this faith community. Bless each one of us, O oh God, that we may celebrate the resurrection of your Son, confident in your love for us and our call to share the good news of your mercy. We ask for these and all things in the name of Jesus Christ, who teaches us when we pray to say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Whether we are at home or at work in the world, we're each given a part to play and a gift to give on the journey from the manger to the cross and beyond. We offer what we can, gifts from the heart, gifts from the hand. We have many ways to practice generosity these days. We continue to check on our elderly neighbors and friends to see what we may be able to do to offer assistance. We participate in our regular Lenten collection for Watertown Social Services. They're especially in need of food items, and you can either drop those things off at Trumbull House or deliver them directly to social services. And we do encourage you to remember your regular giving to the church, which supports all the ministries that we do together. You can donate online, or you can sign up for e-giving on our website, or you can mail in your regular pledges and offerings to the church. We pray that you give generously for Christ's sake. For all that we offer into the world in terms of time, talent, and treasure, I offer this prayer of dedication for today. Loving God, we come to you with hearts full of gratitude. In response to all that we have been given, we give generously of our time and our money with open hearts to love and hands to serve. Help us to give graciously without counting the cost or without judging those in need. Make us worthy of the endless love of Christ our Lord. In his name we pray. Amen.
On this Easter Sunday morning, our first reading from Scripture comes from the Gospel according to John, chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. This is a traditional reading that tells the story of how it was learned that Jesus was raised from the dead. Note especially that it is Mary Magdalene, his close friend, who is alone in the cemetery when she discovers that Jesus' body is gone. And it is through this courageous woman that the rest of the disciples, and indeed all of us, learn about the miracle at Easter. Hear these words. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been rolled away. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the, Jesus, the one Jesus loved, and said, they have taken my Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Now Mary stood out outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her woman, why are you crying? She said, they have taken my Lord away and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, do not hold on to me for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and to your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. I have seen the Lord, she said, and she told them all these things he had said to her. May God's wisdom be added to our hearing and understanding of these holy words for Easter Sunday. Our second reading today is from Romans uh, chapter 8, a letter that Paul sent to the church at Rome. Now this is traditionally not read at Easter, but I'm including it this year to remind us that no matter what we experience, we cannot be separated from God's love for us. So hear these words. What then shall we say to this? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, will he not also give us all things with him? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Is it Christ Jesus who died? Yes, who was raised from the dead? Who is at the right hand of God who intercedes for us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thanks be to God for these words on this Easter day.
Would you pray with me, please? Gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations in all of our hearts be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Everything has changed. When are we going to get back to normal? I don't like having to rethink everything I do. I just want my life back. I need a hug or to hold someone's hand. These are just some of the things we hear these days under the pall of social distancing and the rising death toll that comes with the coronavirus. Most of us are abiding by the guidelines and the rules. We're staying home as much as possible. We're keeping six feet away from others when we do have to go out, but life has gotten weird. Who would have ever imagined that homeschooling would be the rule of the day? Who would have imagined you can't have simple conversations with your neighbors as you peruse the produce at the grocery store? Who would have imagined that so many people would lose their jobs or have to shutter their businesses because of a tiny virus? And who would have imagined that church wouldn't be held in our beautiful sanctuary every Sunday morning? How can that be? Hearing great music, listening to scripture and a sermon, seeing our friends, it all helps reorient the week ahead and give us inspiration as we move forward in life. To go without church is enormously difficult for so many. The truth is, we're mourning the life we used to know. We resist accepting the truth that this has gone on longer than we first anticipated and that it may extend months beyond what we can even imagine as tolerable. We just want things to return to normal, whatever that is. I found several articles this past week that helped me gain a wider perspective on this whole time we're living in, a time called unprecedented by our media and our leaders. Turns out, these days of social distancing are not really so unprecedented. We've done this before. In 1918, a time that almost none of us were alive to see, an influenza pandemic hit. Because of crowded cities, unsanitary conditions, and the fact that we were in the middle of World War I, the pandemic spread with devastating consequences. Here's what one public notice read. Notice is hereby given that in order to prevent the spread of Spanish influenza, all schools, public and private, churches, theaters, moving picture halls, pool rooms, and other places of amusement and lodge meetings are to be closed until further notice. All public gatherings consisting of 10 or more are prohibited. There were, of course, at that time, churches that refused to close. Some felt that closing public worship wasn't necessary. Others simply didn't believe that they would get sick, that God has me covered. And others still felt that closing the doors to the sanctuary was the same as closing the doors on God. Thankfully, however, many Christians disagreed with staying open. The editors of the Christian Century wrote at that time, When religion is inevitably tied up with a meeting house, the closing of public worship means a separation from God. But when religion concerns itself chiefly with human welfare, interpreted from the divine standpoint, we are unwilling that one single person should die of an epidemic for the sake of an ordinance or a theory. At the time, churches were facing into Advent, and many made plans to leave Sunday school materials and instructions for home worship on front doorsteps. And they decided to use the new technology of the telephone to carry church news concerning the sick and the needy. So you see, we may not remember it, but we have done this before. Yet it's hard. In so many ways, our faith relies on a physical embodied presence. We have an incarnational theology, God made real in the flesh of Jesus Christ. We are used to being able to hold hands, hugging, sitting with friends and family in a sanctuary. We put water on people's heads to baptize. We love the smell and the taste of the bread and the juice at communion. We use the senses to celebrate belonging and connection as a people of faith. We sing, we read, we listen, we move, we eat, all because we live in bodies and have this life together. Except now we can't. How can we worship God if we can't go to church? Will Easter have to be canceled? 
During the season of Lent, there are traditionally three practices that Christians engage in to help clarify their spiritual life and draw closer to God. The first is prayer and reflection, taking time to center our thoughts on God and the place of the holy in our lives. Well, so many people are doing that right now, perhaps unintentionally, but it is happening. More than one person has told me they have a new perspective on what's really important. Things like being at home with loved ones, letting go of unnecessary spending, and even taking better care of themselves for the sake of others. The second traditional practice is sacrifice, doing without something for the sake of another. We often hear about things like giving up chocolate or soda for Lent, but there's another kind of sacrifice that we're making right now, staying at home. It's not just about catching the virus, it's about spreading the virus. Staying home is a kind of sacrifice we do for others. We sacrifice freedom of movement, entertainment, and even our jobs for the sake of the well-being of others that we may not even know. And the third spiritual practice is charity, reaching out to those in need. This time of global pandemic has emphasized how much we need to be looking toward the others around us who are sick, who are elderly, living alone or vulnerable in some way. I've heard so many stories about things like stopping to help someone on the roadside, giving away packs of toilet paper, making meals or shopping for a neighbor. All these things are acts of charity or outreach done with Christ-like love for those in need. But here's the key. No spiritual practice makes sense by itself. When we pray, it's not to create a wish list for God to fulfill at our command. It's to strengthen our relationship with God. The goal is communion with God, not getting stuff. Sacrificing for others shouldn't feel like punishment. Sacrifice teaches us the difference between what we need and what we want. It helps us create a leaner, simpler life where there is room for God. And outreach teaches us that we are not the center of the universe. Instead, we are taught to put love into action, practicing the lessons that Jesus teaches us about loving our neighbors as we love ourselves. During Lent, we engage in these practices to prepare us for a better life with God. And then we celebrate as we remember the ultimate sacrifice and act of love, Christ's death and resurrection for us. We work through these practices in order to make room for a better, more fulfilling life. Right now, as we engage in practices like social distancing and staying at home, we also do these for the sake of precious life itself, ours and someone else's. So this year, Easter may not carry the same traditions as in years past, but Easter will still happen even if we cannot be in the church building. I'd like to share part of a piece written by Karen Clark Ristine, Senior Minister of Claremont United Methodist Church in Claremont, California. These are excerpts. She writes, yes, there will be an Easter. Easter is alive in you right now. Easter comes alive in all our senses, in our very being. Easter celebrates life, new life that overcomes even our starkest moments. Easter calls us to hope to hope in one another, to hope in a future we cannot see or imagine yet. Easter is alive in all the ways we reach out to one another across this social distance. Easter is alive with every phone call made to connect with someone who lives alone. Even in the midst of social distancing and sheltering in place, Easter lives in the new ways we are learning to show love and to care for one another. She continues, Easter is not canceled, and neither is church. The church is not a building. The church lives wherever people of faith, any faith, share in love and hope. The church lives in every social media po post of beauty and words of encouragement. The church lives in every text and phone call made to keep connection alive. The church lives in new communication platforms like Zoom and old platforms like phone trees. And for those who practice no faith, for the spiritual but not religious, for the last and the lingering, no one has canceled human kindness. Compassion and hope live now. Human kindness lives now. 
And so, yes, there will be an Easter. If you remember in our scripture passage from the Gospel of John, we saw that on that very first Easter, Mary Magdalene was alone in the cemetery, separated from her friends and loved ones by her grief, unsure what the road ahead would look like. She was interrupted by someone she thought was a gardener, only to discover her savior instead. She wanted to embrace him, to touch him, to connect with him as she always had. But he said, no, don't touch me. In the midst of all her joy, the shock and the relief of that moment, she had to keep her distance. Don't touch me, he said, it's not time. But Easter still happened. The news spread of Jesus' resurrection, and the grief that all of the disciples and friends of Jesus were carrying was dissipated when they learned that he had risen from the dead. Today we have joy with that same news. Christ is risen. In the familiar words of Romans 8, our second reading, we are reminded that nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Nothing. Not the government, not famine, not death, not even a pandemic can separate us from the immense love that God has for each one of us. Love made visible, love made incarnate in our risen Savior. Brothers and sisters, may God bless you this Easter and in all the days to come. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Thanks be to God. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, as we conclude this Easter worship time together, I'd like to share these words of blessing that come from the bridge interim ministers of our Southern New England Conference of the United Church of Christ. Hear these words. Remember that we are a Christmas people and that Jesus is incarnated in every act of love and kindness we extend to one another. Remember that we are an Easter people and we know that God can reach us beyond all the barriers the world can create. Remember that we are a Pentecost people who know that the Holy Spirit can revive us and who will be our strength in times of great distress. We can do this. We are the church, the body of the risen Christ. May God bless you and all you do this joy joyous Easter day and beyond. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen.